Hello everybody, welcome back to Reaper Minis TV. By now, WoW Alex94's blister of zombie mouselings is on his way to him. And like I mentioned in the last episode, we're going to have another giveaway for Christmas. So go ahead and subscribe. It's going to be open to all subscribers. But for now, we're going to get back into reviews. And we'll be starting off with three chronoscope blisters, the first of which is Zulu Warriors number two. So that means there is a Zulu Warriors number one, or just Zulu Warriors blister that I'll show you in a second. But in Zulu Warriors two, you get three guys, and they have headdresses on, and they're carrying spears, and their shields are the large oval animal skin covered variety. They come as separate pieces that are cast on a sprue by themselves. You'll have to clip each one off, and then put it in place on the, the guy himself. And as you can see in the video, each guy needed a little bit of bending back into place of their spears. They're sticking out, so they're a little bit prone to getting bent in the blister pack. And there were also some visible mold lines on the figures. And here's a quick still picture look at the Zulu Warriors number one, or the first blister. The main difference between the two is in the first blister, Two of the guys are carrying rifles, and in the second blister, they're just all carrying spears. And both varieties of Zulu warriors bear a striking resemblance to Reaper's Malapango savages that you can see here. Now, I have a warlord army that I've built that is using a Revan or Orc and Goblin list that uses the Malapango savages and dinosaurs in place of Orcs and Goblins and things like that. And it also uses some cavemen. I think I've talked about it in the past. Um, I think they'd be great to bulk up that army for me, but I think you could also use the Malapango Savages and the Zulus together in a large Zulu force and maybe combine these with the British Colonials that we saw last episode and do a reenactment of the movie Zulu or something like that. Next up we have Smedley Cloverdash, who is an evil time-traveling villain. I guess evil and villain is redundant. But anyway, he's a single-piece miniature, and he has a very deliberate Victorian kind of steampunk look to him, but he is just covered in details from his top hat that has goggles on it that are kind of on the outside of his top hat to uh, beard and mustache and ruffles on his shirt and the buttons on his shirt and the belt buckle and a key dangling from it. He's got a mechanical leg that has all kinds of little rivets and pistons and things in it that you can make out details on. It's just a very cool figure that is loaded with extra details. So it might be a little bit daunting to paint, but I think it would be a very good challenge. It's a very cool looking figure, but it sort of falls into the category of figures that you need a pretty specific use for it. I think that he'd fit in fine if you were playing an RPG in the Iron Kingdoms world, that's the world of War Machine and Hordes, or if you maybe used him as a time-traveling supervillain in a superhero RPG. I think he'd work well there. But very cool figure, lots of detail. I think he'd be a lot of fun to paint. And next we have Abraham Van Helsing, the arch enemy of Dracula. Single piece miniature here. He's carrying a crucifix that is a combination of a crucifix and a stake in his left hand, and he's got a mallet in his right hand. On his belt, he carries a large dagger on one side, and on the other side, he has another crucifix and a Star of David, so both emblems for warding off the undead. On his belt, it looks like he has some little bitty pouches, so they look like they're too small for another steak. They might contain garlic, or maybe they contain vials of holy water. You can see he's wearing a very heavy cloak that has the collar pulled up around his neck and a wide-brimmed hat. There were some little bits of metal from the casting process that needed to be cleaned and some visible mold lines. Most of the mold lines were pretty faint, but there was a thicker one that ran across the top of his hat. This was a little bit thicker than the other mold lines, but it was also easily removed because it was on a flat part, no curves to mess with or anything like that. In spite of his name, I think you could use him as any undead hunting hero, and the most applicable game that comes to mind immediately would be dropping him into a Call of Cthulhu campaign or something like that, or you could drop him into West Wind's gothic horror miniatures game without a second thought. Next up we have three blisters from Reaper's P65 line, and hopefully you remember P65 is their line of figures that uses a uh, lead-based alloy instead of the regular white metal alloy that's used in the Dark Heaven Legends and the Warlord and Chronoscope and their other lines. Generally, in the P65 line, you're going to save a little bit of money 
versus the original figure that might have been released in the Dark Heaven Legends or whichever line that it originally came out in, but it is going to be a lead-based alloy, so the metal itself is a little softer. It's okay, not softer like you're going to push on it and it's just going to deform in your fingers just because you're pushing on it, but just so you know, it is going to be a different metal alloy than what you're getting in the Dark Heaven Legends and the rest of their lines. So whenever we look at P65 figures, I'm going to try to make sure that I show you both the P65 version and price and the original price too. First up, we have a blister that contains a Dark Elf Cleric as a single piece, and then as the second figure in the blister, you get a two-piece skeleton that's carrying a large book on his back, and he's sort of hunched over. It's a normal size skeleton, except that he's hunched over, so it's definitely not the size of a regular familiar that you might have for a spellcaster. So as an evil cleric, being a dark elf, evil cleric, probably not a big stretch there, this is probably a skeleton that she's reanimated, and he's here to carry around her book of rituals or her spell book, and also he's got a big pouch that has several scrolls in it, so he's a scroll caddy if you're familiar with the term from Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and he's also got some other pouches and potions and things like that that he's carrying around for her. She would fit in well with the DHL classic Dark Elves that we looked at previously. Uh, maybe not so much with the new Dark Reach Dark Elves, but as a single spellcaster, I would have no problem at all dropping her into my Dark Elf army for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Next up is a Moor Hound, and this is a two-piece miniature where the left front leg is a separate piece, but it goes right into place kind of at where the shoulder joint would be. This is a very well-muscled evil dog. You can see he's just got muscles upon muscles. The hair is nicely sculpted, and his mouth is open, which is bearing a lot of really large, sharp-looking teeth. I could see using him as the lead hound, maybe, in a group of Chaos Hounds for a Warriors of Chaos army for Warhammer. I could also maybe see dropping him into a Vampire Count army as an undead hound, again, in the lead dog kind of role there. Or you could use it as a really large hellhound for D&D. Last of the P65 figures for this episode is going to be a Crystal Golem, and initially this guy reminded me a lot of a figure that I saw and had for the Chainmail game. It was called an Ice Para Elemental, and I think in D&D using this as a Crystal kind of Golem would be fine, but if you wanted to use it as some kind of Ice Elemental or something like that, I think he would fit that role just perfectly. It comes in three pieces where the two arms are separate, and you can see you've got the whole body as a piece that has lots of crystal or ice shards or whatever you want to paint them up as sticking out over, mostly over the back is where they're sticking out, but you can see there's a lot of very big flat angles all over the figure itself. There were some mold lines that needed to be cleaned, but because of the nature of the figure, being a crystalline creature, they were mostly on flat areas, so you're going to be able to scrape off the mold line pretty smoothly and cleanly without marring the figure at all. And I think another use for the figure could be in a superhero game. If you had some kind of weird mutated crystal supervillain, I think he'd work well for that too. And the last figure we have to look at is from the Pathfinder line, and this is a Hookmaw Krieg. It's a giant, or a, well, pretty large ogre. It seems to be larger than a regular variety ogre, and it comes in a couple of pieces. You get a 40 millimeter plastic base, and then you've got three pieces that make up the figure itself. You've got the main body, and you can see he's got a bunch of skulls around his neck and even some on his belt. This is just a huge, burly ogre. Um, just massive, massive figure with big muscles. Not overly so like cartoony, though. And you've got the other two pieces here. You've got his head and then a big sickle that is on a sprue by itself, so you're going to have to take these off and put them into place on the miniature. Now, just his arm and weapon itself are about the size of a normal human-sized figure, so it's pretty darn big. So let's pry the head off for a second and see how it fits into place, and we'll clean it up later on before I paint it, but really unique feature of the head and the face is that, as I drop it, his jaw, upper and lower, are kind of like tied on or sewn on or riveted on, and he's got these big giant metal plates there and metal kind of teeth. So um, on the arm itself, you can see it fits in right at the shoulder, no problem there. He did need a bit of cleaning, but that's expected with a miniature of this size, and I think this would make an absolutely awesome butcher or bruiser in an Ogre Kingdom's army for Warhammer Fantasy, and I happen to have a friend who's running an Ogre army, so I think this figure will probably find his way into his army. 
All right, everybody. Thanks for watching this episode of Reaper Minis TV. We'll see you next time.